so welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, my name's Charlotte Vincent. I'm the artistic director of Vincent Dance Theatre. It's very lovely to see you all. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Kath, Kath Lambert. I mean, I'm based in the sociology department here. And we've done a couple of events um, since BBT started to come to Warwick Arts Centre to just try and find the link between some of the social issues uh, and the feminist issues that thread through my work and the work that Kath's doing around embodiment and um, obviously sociological, socio-political um, threads in her work. And last night we had a bit of a chat um, more focused on, I suppose, my work and how autobiographical it is in a way and how it marks and threads through my life and is a sort of vomit of, <laughs> of my life onto the stage, crafted, obviously, <laughs> um, and composed. And today, Kath is going to lead the session more um, around embodied methods, um, which may or may not mean anything to you. But rather than talk about to you today, <laughs> we thought we'd kick-start with a bit of a chat and then um, open it up for discussion, because we know that some of you are on the This Is Tomorrow programme, and if it's day four, you're probably losing the will to live um, and probably have nothing to say about anything anymore. That's what happened to me by day four. Or you just have verbal diarrhoea um, and you can't stop talking, which I think is the other thing that happened to me when I did it. Anyway, um, should we just whiz round the table quickly and introduce yourselves, um, just so we know who's in the room? And then Catherine <coughs> will yep. kick start. So I'm Charlotte, I'm the Artistic Director of Vincent Dance Theatre. We had a show last night, we've got one tonight. I think some of you are coming, please do come. Uh, it's a solo show. We're also touring uh, a big ensemble piece at the moment, marking our 21st anniversary of slogging it, um, touring and making new work. So hi, I'm Paul Warwick. I am uh, one half of China Plate, who are the associate producers here at Warwick Arts Centre, and we are running the This Is Tomorrow programme. I'm Helen, I'm on the This Is Tomorrow programme, I'm a theatre maker and performer and I have a company called Rush Dash. I'm Abby, I'm a theatre maker and performer and I run Rush Dash with Helen. Can everybody hear? Are we okay for hearing? Hello. Uh, Chris, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to you in a minute, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eleanor, uh, I'm here with This Is Tomorrow and I'm a writer. Hi, I'm Charmian. I'm an ex-graduate or graduate from Warwick. I'm interested in cultural value, aesthetics, dance, parenting, life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm Shehar and I'm just here for this morning. Great. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Matt Oman. I'm the head of programme and audiences at Warwick. And in case somebody doesn't know what This Is Tomorrow is, does mm. anybody know what This Is Tomorrow is? Yeah. Uh, so This Is Tomorrow is a programme of encounters and meetings between artists and, and the academics, which is in its fourth year. Charlotte was on the uh, programme Second one, I think, yeah, two years ago. Uh, so over the course of this week, the, the artists and makers around the table are meeting something like 45, 50 academics um, across a range of departments, including uh, maths, pace, uh, politics, uh, sociology, medical school, and economics. economics. With a view to maybe collaborating in future, yes, sorry, or yeah, finding common that. threads. We're looking at some treatments from yeah. uh, the artists um, involved in the process in a couple of months, when they produce the time. A couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Hello, I'm Anna Williams, and I'm a choreographer and performer. And also be in a, my rehearsal director for Charlie's people. Chris Hello, I'm Jane. I, um, I'm a teacher fellow, I'm a social work master here, but I'm also um, a visual artist. Great. Uh, I'm Ed, I'm co director of China Plates, associate producer at Warwick Art Centre. Hello, I'm Erica, I'm a theatre director, and I work at the IRC with special responsibility for new work, and I'm on the Hello, I'm Susanna, I'm a sociology student here at work, and I also perform a lot in my spare time. Hello, I'm Becky, and I'm based at the Institute for Advanced Teaching and Learning here, and I'm really interested in innovative learning spaces, which is why I'm here this morning. Hello there, I'm Adam, I'm at the sociology department as a student, and um, yeah, I'm pretty interested in <laughs> um, youth education, education of the arts, things like that, and the spaces it can be performed in. I am Chris, I'm a writer and a performer and I'm here with This Is Tomorrow. Welcome everybody. 
Do you um, think that maybe the people at that end should shimmy down this way a bit? Because we, we, you missed the bit where I said shimmy this way so you're not quite so far away. And I'll just squeeze up a bit. Like a big long dinner table. Yeah, I mean, sort of stay in the circle, but just so that no one's got their backs to anyone. And all that. Sorry, it's just the choreographer coming out to me. <laughs> just need order. Right. Okay. Um, what a lovely mix of people. It's a great mix, and I think we're going to really exploit that in the session this morning. Um, this is the plan. Um, the... In a minute, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes and just um, present a few ideas and why I wanted to kind of have this session and bring this particular bunch of people together. Um, and then, after I've stopped talking, I'll kind of open out those, what are hopefully kind of questions and provocations that are interesting in different ways to everybody in the room, um, so that we can just have a discussion um, you know, that will loosely facilitate and everybody um, hopefully will you know, have things to input um, and bounce off each other. Um, I'd quite like to keep that, that process to about an hour um, so that we've got some time to explore the space, because as you'll see, you know, we're in the middle of this fascinating table. It's quite hard to concentrate when you've got, you know, weapons and shoes and blood and all the rest of it in front of you. There's been fascinating things going on in here um, all week, um, and so it would be nice for you to be able to carry on the conversations and the ideas that we start in this first formal bit um, over some of the activities, maybe looking at some of the um, stuff that's been produced. Um, in the last few days, um, watch um, Glass House, the film, whatever. Um, so it'd be a bit more kind of loose and fluid in the second half, but making full use of, of the space while we're in it. Um, I started this session off um, calling it Dancer's Method. Um, and I think I've kind of changed the title a little bit now, just over the last few days. Um, and I've started to think of it as more of a kind of a dance of social scientists and artists. Um, or even perhaps a, a, a partnering of social scientists and artists to, uh, to build on one of um, Charlotte's tropes. Um, and there are kind of two... This is a little bit um, of a crude way to, to, to build on it, but maybe it's just a way of setting out the arguments. Um, that I'm going to start with um, putting things kind of from the perspective of artists and cultural practitioners and thinking about how they might move towards social science um, in a way and then consider why social scientists might move towards art and cultural practice um, as a way of thinking about what that partnering or intermingling or whatever might be. Um, and so to start with the, the kind of art artist's perspective, um, there's been, of course, long-standing, but particularly intensively at the moment, lots of debates around cultural value um, and how we can... Um, account for the value that is art and culture. And I'm guessing that everybody sitting around this room believes very strongly and passionately that there is a real value to art and culture in all its forms, but we also really struggle to kind of evidence that and document it in ways that count. And it might be problematic that, that those ways that count are the ways we have to evidence it, but nonetheless, that is the game. And recent funding calls at the moment, some of you will know, some of you will have been working frantically on the the recent Arts Council's um, call that, that brings money to cultural organisations ex explicitly and exclusively for research that kind of goes beyond evaluation that is kind of academic um, research of their practice because, of course, the Arts Council is deeply invested in, uh, in providing this kind of, of evidence of how art works and what kind of impact it has. Um, and there's also, many of you will know, um, a, a recent report come out from the Warwick Commission on Cultural Value um, that has also been investigating at kind of lots of different levels um, these questions as well. So it's very much in the water at the moment um, and, of course, has a real um, material economic imperative because a lot of organisations now kind of can't survive unless they can really prove the value of what they do in the kinds of currencies that, that matter. Um, so there are kind of quite practical issues here. But also, and this is where you know, artists might want to have their input in a bit, you know, many artists also themselves w want to evidence and be able to articulate um, in ways that communicate with people who maybe don't speak the art languages what the value of their work is. You know, they, they believe strongly that it has cultural and emotional and political, social, maybe even economic value, um, but, but articulating that is something that, um, that it can be quite difficult to do um, outside of the languages in which um, they are really skilled and ex expert. So all of these different kind of impulses are leading towards collaborations of different kinds um, between arts and cultural practitioners and social scientists. 
Um, and in many cases, they find, as I think is the case with um, Charlotte and I collaborating, and I also do a lot of work with Fierce Festival in Birmingham, and it's very much the same there, that actually the, the kind of underpinnings, the, the stuff that we're interested in is pretty much the same. Um, you know, it's, but but the, the ways we do it and our kind of practices in our day-to-day -day lives, of, of the way of living what, what we're interested in is very, very different. So there's lots of very interesting things to learn um, from each other's practices and languages um, in this case between dance and social science, um, but all the very, very other various different languages of, of live art. Um, and so we might want to just have a think um, in a few minutes about what some of the challenges um, and also the, the pleasures and the pains of these kinds of collaborations may be. And I know there's lots of people here who do have real expertise in those, so we'll have experiences to share, and other people that are perhaps just starting out on those kinds of collaborations and exploring um, the possibilities. Um, so that's kind of how it might be from the artist's perspective and obviously I'm not an artist and so other people might want to challenge that or add to that um, or um, refine it or whatever and that's, that's great. Um, from the perspective of a social scientist, um, I, I think to know is not just a, an intellectual and cognitive and textual endeavour, although you would think it was from the, you know, the way that we kind of teach um, and research. We also know with our bodies and our feelings and our emotions, our senses of sight and touch and sound and smell, um, and our memories are very often embodied and sensory, or even the kind of narrative and cognitive memory is triggered by a sensory experience. And this is kind of obvious, um, we all know it in a very everyday sense, but certainly within social sciences, um, we really struggle to account for and to include those kinds of experiences of knowing um, and the knowledges that they lead to in our analysis. Um, within social science-based methods and methodologies, there's still, despite decades and decades of insight from feminist and post-structural theories, um, there's still a real over-reliance on um, and a kind of reification, I think, of methodologies that seek sort of objective or verif verifiable truths about the world. Um, we create distinctions, I think, in our work between the felt and the emotional and the pre-verbal, um, the subconscious, whatever we want to, whatever words we want to use, um, and on one hand, and then the thought through or the verbalised on the other. We kind of create these as if they, they happen in different, you know, even though it's in one body that you feel things and express them, we create a kind of artificial conceptual divide. Like we can't talk about the stuff that happens at that level, we only can talk about it once it becomes out there, if you like. Um, and we render the stuff that's kind of felt or pre-verbal or whatever as something that can never be known. It's not like we deny that it happens, but we can't know it. And of course, knowledge is the stuff of, of social science. Um, we can't really touch it with our empirical studies, our kind of going out and finding facts about the world. Um, and instead, the thought through, the reflexive, the conscious articulation is instead the proper stuff of investigation and the sources of our data. Mm. And with some exceptions, that's pretty much how it is, I think. Um, and I think this is a real serious neglect and that we need to be much more attentive to the sensory and the embodied and the affective, emotional affective experiences because they are how people are in the world and how they understand the world. Um, as well, of course, as the cognitive. I'm not denying the importance of the cognitive and the reflexive um, modes of expression, but we need to think of both. Um, and therefore, we need methods and we need theory, we need conceptual frameworks for accessing and making sense of sensory and embodied and affective um, experiences. Um, and I've called these kind of emotional or um, embodied or sensory methods as a shorthand. So that was where the, the title, you know, dance as method, embodiment as method. It's just a way of kind of thinking about, about this as, as method. Other sociologists use the term live methods to address similar sorts of concerns. Um, and they draw attention to the temporality of our research and how you want to be able to generate and document and analyse experiences as, as they're lived and capture things kind of in that, in that moment. And so the resources for developing these kind of methods um, are already around us. Um, they're in technologies for sure, but also, I think, and this is the kind of the bringing together, they're also there in arts-based practice. Practice-based research, many of you might be familiar with that term and, and, and use it. Um, it's much more recognised method in art, in fine art, in theatre, in performance studies. Um, 
and but very very little is kind of recognised or utilised or understood um, in social science. So a more practice-based method might involve social scientists experimenting with arts-based techniques, kind of curating sociology, um, and or developing collaborations with practitioners whose medium for knowledge production um, and intellectual investigation is performance or dance, um, music, image, or, and, and other things. Um, so that's the kind of the set of provocations from sort of both sides. Um, and in an oversimplified sense, making an argument that both of these kind of people, sets of people, sets of practitioners, have much to gain. Um, but it's never as simple as that, you know, either in practice or <coughs> in, in thinking through the consequences. And so, you know, what I'm hoping by bringing this particular interesting diverse bunch of people around the table is that we can perhaps think through um, some of those, of those problematics, um, either by sharing our experiences of them or um, our worries or our questions or our ideas. Are there any immediate responses or thoughts to what Kath's just said? Because I've got lots whizzing around my brain. I mean, any immediate thoughts or responses about those kind of provocations? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> I would kick off by saying yes. I, I um, teach on the social work masters. So a lot of the work that we do is around um, creating, getting students to understand the sense of self and how themselves impact on situations. One of the things I think I'm really interested in Kath, is that idea about trying to, um, the way that um, uh, experiences, narrative and kind of uh, cognitive experiences can be kind of triggered by um, things, you know, discussion, uh, smells, so any kind of sensory stuff. And I think one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is trying to put words, we're trying to get people to put words to their feelings mm. other than just the usual sets of words that we use to describe our feelings. So, and also to try and describe the feelings of, of the unknown, really. Because deeply embedded in what Kath's talking about, I think, is um, the difference between metaphor and literality. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's something that we talked a little bit about last night. And obviously a movement language on or off the stage allows um, the, the poetics or the readings to be slightly um, ambiguous. And you can project your experience, we talked about this like last night, onto whatever I or you or whoever might be on the stage. If it's an open, if it's clear but open and not didactic, you can read from it um, and project onto it your own life experiences. If it's, like, it's a sort of cliche of like, it, like the person's political in, in, in the work that I make, but what I put on stage aims to be universal in that you might not exactly have my experience or my thought, but you can read from it and take from it something of your own because you'll be projecting your own stuff into it. If you see what I mean? So it becomes an exchange rather than um, a, a force-fed uh, didacticism, if that's the right word. But one thing I think is really interesting, I mean, there's so many things in my head about what you just said, but how do we give value to the currency of emotions and how do we measure success when our currency is, in my case, an emotional as well as a physical currency. And I don't think we've cracked being able to talk about that, like say, in terms of the language we use. And I'm not sure we're a, a, a national portfolio organisation, we have to um, uh, articulate key performance indicators all the time around bums on seats and uh, I don't know how I just so sort of lost interest that I don't even know what we're measuring anymore. But how we measure what we're doing is completely inappropriate for the things that I'm doing. So in a way, without getting into bashing the arts council or the government who fund us to do what we do, it's that thing of like what we do doesn't have um, a scale of measurement that suits the thing that we're doing. So there's a sort of bureaucratic system that's been imposed on an artistic practice. Mm that doesn't quite, it's not really a fit. I mean, of course you can measure how many people sit in the theatre or, but how do you really measure beyond capturing, as we all do, the evaluation of what people say when they come out of, say, a show or come out of an experience like this? And we're, we're, we're gathering that all the time, but I feel like the emphasis is so much on gathering um, inappropriate um, evidence, to use your word, 
that we're missing a trick in terms of how we find the language to articulate the very thing that we're doing that makes people want to come and see it in the first place, which is emotional. It's the messy stuff we were talking about last mm. night. It's, it's the emotion. It's the affective experiences, as you called them. It's how we are in the world. It's not empirical, actually. It's not cognitive. That's one thought that I have. And then the second thought is the work that I make is very much, interestingly, in terms of who I collaborate with and the processes that I'm involved with, a, a real mix of cognitive and intelligence and meaning and literality, words, and this other language which is abstract and metaphorical and um, movement-based. So I feel like in my actual practice in the studio, I'm embodying or clashing those two cultures in the actual making of stuff, and that doesn't really get articulated much either. So I think for me, those are the two areas that, I mean, for me, obviously, I don't know if that um, resonates with anyone else, but how we measure and give value to the practice and the, the emotional um, investment that artists make, how we articulate that as a verifiable truth as opposed to a bum on a seat. Um, and does that actually have any currency? Because I don't actually believe it does have much currency in a bureaucratic, government-led, government-funded system. Um, and yet, that's why I keep getting my money. <laughs> so that's the, that's the irony. I keep getting the support because I know I'm doing that and they know I'm doing it. But it's sort of the bit that gets brushed under the carpet. It's like, okay, you've got 500 people there and 20 people there. That's the bit that gets measured. But whatever I put in my report, say, to the Arts Council will be all the other stuff as well. But I'm not sure how they measure that, really, apart from in a conversation with my relationship officer or with the head of dance or whatever. So that's an interesting sort of split... It's kind of split. I feel like I'm talking two different languages to the same person to try and justify what I'm doing. Um, yes, yeah, so does anyone have any responses about how do we give value to the currency in which we work as artists? And, and what are the links between sociology, social work, um, and the other practices that we're talking about? But how do you measure your success? Or how do you measure what, you, what you're doing? Mm -mm. How do you measure what you're doing? Is it just if you feel happy with something you've made? Well, we or is it how many people clap <coughs> at the end? <laughs> is it how many people are at bums on seat? I guess it's um, often down to anecdotal evidence, so yeah. conversations we have with people after yeah. a show feel yeah. really important. Um, important to you, but do you think they're important, important to anybody to you? else? Well, we often include them as attachments yeah. in an arts council yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I... Uh, I think they're important to... I think they're the primary thing that most artists are interested in, probably. I don't know. I'm speaking for myself. Mm. That's the thing I'm most interested in. But obviously I can't have conversations with everyone. And Twitter is a way that people do respond to you, but it's a soundbite. I feel like the thing that's interesting about it for me is that you, we have to... You make work in one language and you have to respond to it in another language that we have given more value to. Yeah, yeah. So no one, you can't write a critical or an academic essay physically. But I'm also, when you say that the, the words are literal and that the movement is ambiguous and metaphorical, I feel like movement has the ability to be incredibly be specific, specific yeah. at points. Yeah, yeah. And I think that words sometimes masquerade as being more specific than they are. So I think sometimes we think that we all know what we mean when we use a certain word, but actually everyone's got a different idea of what is meant by that yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's a problem, I think, that, 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 that that's what we think language is, that's what we think verbal language is. No, I we, totally yeah. agree that, I mean, if you see the show tonight, there are some very clear articulations and there's no language in it at all. And it's very specific what yeah. we're always doing. I think. So I totally agree. I was trying to make a point <laughs> yeah. by polarising those two things. But yeah, absolutely. But I think the bigger problem is that we think that language is so specific, when I, verbal language is well, so specific. I suppose the canon of, of textual language has been given more weight, <laughs> because mm. of Shakespeare and all the greats, you know, maybe more than the ballets and the, you know, certainly in the contemporary yeah. uh, movement-based canon. Isn't I mean, I think it is specific in a way that, that movement language isn't, but it's just the problem with saying, this is a kind of what we mean, and this is what it is. I think verbal language goes, this is what it absolutely is, and it's mm. not for everyone. Mm. Yeah. So one of the other things that I was thinking of as Kath was um, talking about is exactly sort of what you're saying, uh, articulating is, I mean I work interdisciplinarily <laughs> and across disciplines of music, visuality, movement, call it dance if you want to, text, um, 
and I suppose, as I said before, that's it, it's a it's a clash of um, the in meaning and feeling, uh, emotion and specificity, and and it's it, and it's mixed up. And I I wonder if the key to unlocking how we articulate our practices in a way that gets taken more seriously is by focusing on this um, the notion of interdisciplinarity and also the notion of collaboration and how what actually happens in a collaboration either between two art forms or two you know a writer and a dancer or a, a social scientist or a, and a choreographer or whatever I just don't think we're very good at articulating that because the the, because the language that we have to use is is, is text yeah like right. if I went to a conference and danced my way through my response, yeah. half the people in the audience would probably just kind of yes, because it's not common language. Yeah, but I also think that like sometimes <laughs> anymore in that work we sometimes uh, rely on the words to give context to the emotional thing that we mm. want to say, mm. and it's interesting because words obviously are incredibly emotionally articulate as well, and I think that movement can be articulate about things other than the felt experience because mm -hmm. we have a felt experience with lots of things that aren't necessary that are cerebral mm -hmm. so separating them in that way I, I also find difficult in my own work mm -hmm. going how do I want to how what's my felt response to this very cerebral notion I think also um, and do butt in if you're <laughs> interested um, I think the way that universities are set up where they separate out the you know music dance generally um, Theatre, performance, live art, <laughs> visual art, uh, and the way that I suppose the funding bodies do that as well encourages us to think of them as separate forms, whereas really they're all just articulation. And I know in my own practice, I'll just pull on whatever I need to make something happen and to find that um, specific thing that I'm trying to say. I'll find the appropriate language to say it, whatever that is. So. I think we can find the appropriate languages. It's just how do we share them publicly so it's not this kind of magical thing that happens in the studio and then you present the finished product. It's how do we give access to, to the processes that actually take place and include people in it. And what's been really interesting about running this space is that people are really quite free. If you give them the opportunity to get stuck in, they'll get stuck in, not, not just because they're arty, arty mm. students, but because they want to you know, feel things and get messy. So I think it's about opportunity as well, isn't it? I was thinking, sorry, <clears throat> about what you were saying about how do you measure like the success mm. of a production. Um, a few years ago, maybe a year or two ago, there was a dance show called Out of the Shadow, not Met Nobilis or something, and I went to see it and I was absolutely blown away and I went to see it again. And this show inspired me to start dancing and um, after that, you know, I, I entered dance competitions and it just like, it really changed my life and I never let them know this. Mm. So how are they supposed to know about the impact mm. that their work has had on people if I don't tell them your productions? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, I'm probably not the only person no, who, who's been to a show and thought, God, that was amazing, mm. and never, never told anybody. How, how do you get people to respond? How, isn't the normal thing, isn't the done thing to see a show, love it, and then go home in the car and say, yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Actually, I think with the advent of Twitter and Facebook and emails, yeah. it isn't, actually. I get lots of yeah. um, emails or tweets or whatever that say, wow. Well, yeah. um, but even if you do, I bet there are people who watch your shows, oh, love yeah. them, and don't let you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my own family. <laughs> <laughs> because people don't always want to process it. Because, you know, mm -hmm. if I go and see... I was talking about this last night. If I go to MoMA and see William Kentridge or, or um, you know, Jackson Pollock, I don't necessarily want to write about it. I just want to feel the experience and sit with the painting for about an hour and then go and have a cup of tea and process it. I don't want to go, oh, guess what? I just, you know, because that's part of the problem. We're sort of splaying ourselves all the time. We were talking about this last night. Everything has to be, you know, Instagrammed and uploaded and shared and digitised. The fact that you respond to it like that, that you just want to be a bit of an hour, is surely a, a measure of success. Yes, but like you say, nobody articulates that yeah. and nobody necessarily knows that that's happening. Um, and in a way, why should they? I think we're in a measuring crazy world. Why should we fucking measure everything? It's driving me mad, I have to say. Maybe measure is not the right word because there's something that I just... Or evidence. I can't, evidence it. I can't quite get it, but it is important that, that people are immersed in an experience and that they're having these kinds of feelings. And this is kind of important stuff for us to know. Not about everybody at every time, but it's like we never... It's part of understanding the world, yeah. and let alone making claims to the Arts Council. You know, it's kind of... They're, they're, it's important just in a, a kind of knowledge sense, an intellectual sense. 
but there's something I think about researching with that experience rather than researching on it. Mm. So rather than you know methods that rely on somebody then saying I had a great time or I felt this or where, which is then when it becomes the verbal and the textual and mm. the, what you're seeking from your you know your um, your MA students. Instead, how can we? Uh, just be with that experience in some way. Eve Lomax has this knowledge that slips and mm. being with knowledge, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a certain way and mm. kind of working with the language of the, the emotion or the feeling um, rather than then superimposing a new kind of language-based yeah. explanation on top of it. And I think that's in some ways what I'm more interested in rather than how can we find the words or, you know, pin people down and say, what did you think of that? Which I think is actually... a Problematic. We, do. Yeah, we yeah. have to do it, yeah. but everybody kind of knows it's not that interesting. It's you know it is kind of evaluation in a way, and it and it doesn't really tell you much either because you know you just get I liked it, I didn't like it, you know whatever. You've lost the real kind of complexity of the experience. I think there's a. I mean I don't want to get too bogged down in that because I think there are more interesting things to talk about. I think the. Uh, when we evaluate, uh, we in paper discussions and in workshops we use Liz Lerman's critical response technique, technique which is um, ha which, which starts with the question how what had meaning for you in what you just saw, rather than did you like it yeah. or not? Because otherwise, if you say did you like it or not, you're going yeah, yeah. nowhere fast. <laughs> it's just a, a monosyllabic answer. Yes, I did. No, I didn't. It made me cry. It made me laugh. Whatever. But I think if you start by posing the question, what if anything had meaning for you? then much richer, layered, more layered responses come back. And then the next stage of her technique is, is for um, the artist to ask the audience questions, not the other way around. So that you're already having to do the work, because frankly, we've done it already, so you need to do it now. And, and, and find ways of giving feedback about the work through asking intelligent questions. I, and think, then, that's, yeah, I and think that's very important. Sorry, I was just going to say that it's work as a statement or work as a dialogue. Yes. You know? And I yeah. think perhaps now we've... Um, People are too passive in um, witnessing work, you know, or perhaps saying this is something that I need to take away rather than evoking my response to it. I think there are many forms of work in art that um, perhaps that requires a statement, like an evidence based of what does this tell people, and maybe like in proposals to the arts council and stuff like that. You're trying to say this is the the feel I want to give, rather than perhaps celebrating the confusion or the, the wide spectrum mm. of um, feedback. But I'm also wondering of. about, as we're talking, I'm wondering about um, this sort of trend in the last four or five years for immersive theatre and sort of being a participant and, uh, and a protagonist to a certain extent in, in the experience of wandering through a building or catching glimpses or breaking up the narrative by not seeing a show end on, you know, stuff like that. I'm wondering how, how that connects to what we're talking about, actually, that, that, that the audience need to feel that they have more currency in the exchange and the dialogue, to use your word, between what goes on on stage and what I'm experiencing off sitting here in the dark. And, I mean, I don't really care what form it takes as long as it affects people and, and um, moves them in some way whether it's a, a physical movement, like, oh, this is interesting, or, or, in, or an intellectual shift or an emotional movement. It's that, um, yeah, it's, it's not the movement itself, it's what moves the audience, I suppose, to, to paraphrase people. Oh. Um, but I, I am interested in the trend of, of wanting to have more, just more of a deal in the, in the transaction, I think, that, that immersive theatre is trying to kind of um, offer an audience. I think, for me, it's part of a larger picture of, of all this sharing that we're doing, all this kind of, yeah, oversharing <laughs> in some cases through digital media. It's something about, I want more than for you to just perform for me. I want to sort of, somehow, it, for it to be more tangible, so I'm right close up to it. And yeah, great, why not? I think you can get the same effect on a proscenium march, actually, if the work's mm. good. Um, so it's, for me, it's like, how close do you have to get? It's, it's an issue of proximity and it is for me related to what we were talking about last night about our relationship with social media and how we present ourselves digitally and how that is separate from the real us and how that's a dangerous area of work around you know, the pornographication of women's bodies for example through that sort of I'm going to disembody myself by putting my breasts online and, you, and somehow that's me, that's a version of me um, and for me, it's the same. It's part of the same spectrum of proximity and distance. 
how you want to get closer to whatever it is that's going on. It's like a greed and a hunger. And I don't know about it. I don't know about that. I'm interested in the separation as well as the closeness with art. You know, the distinctions. What do people think about that digital thing? Because I think I was thinking more about that after we talked about it last night. Um, not least because there's you know, this the, this workshop itself, as um, as in the yeah. the stuff that the, the you know the archive and engagement yeah, workshop. We'll tell you what this is in a minute. Sorry, yeah, and you can have a play with it. But that that is um is, is asking the participants, um, most of whom here have been quite young people from mm. colleges and, and university, to respond to the artwork and the and the tasks and things. Um, digitally, and so you know, tweeting their responses and emailing their responses, and actually, you know, we've been talking about this going through some of the the material that they've produced, which is amazing and interesting and fascinating as data, actually. So you know, mm. this kind of we're answering some of our own questions just mm. by doing this process. Um, but I'm not sure it does present a a, a kind of an unreal or a different. Um, not real from the distinction from the, the real person, as it were. This kind of no, idea not that this, is because this is considered and constructed what, and manipulate, m manipulative. I'm right? not sure it's so different, though. You know, it's I suppose I'm talking about. Um, I mean, I don't want to get sidetracked on that because I talked about it last night. But um, the experience that I've had with young women on tour who are not treating the digital images of their own body as their own. They're so objectified that they are distanced from their mm. own thoughts and feelings and emotional experience. Mm. I'm talking about sexual abuse and, you know, getting pissed and men getting hold of images and circulating among friends. That sort of stuff that we know goes on. That is um, somehow it's not if it's on here and over there, so it's not me. And for me, that's a, a, a big chasm. That's um, it's a moat between the real physical me and the digital representation of me. And I suppose I mean we could talk more about that, but. But, but it's important because those kinds of digital technologies are potentially one of the ways in which mm. we can think about this quick capture, alternative mm. capture, mm. something that's more visual, audio, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, it, that it starts to attend to this idea of live methods or, you know, exactly. emotional instant methods. Exactly. And so it is quite important. And I think we've got, I agree that, mm. you know, what you're saying absolutely happens. And, you know, we need to be able to articulate context, that and understand it. it. But it's not necessarily that. And so we don't want to kind of... But take yeah. all the technology. No, no, because of course what, what Sean and I have designed here is exactly that. It's an integration of physical objects that have history mm -hmm. and the use of digital technology. So basically there's 21 tasks around the table and the groups and people that are coming in are basically sitting and reading the tasks and then doing the tasks. And most of the responses are either take a picture and tweet it or um, Instagram it or come onto my Instagram account or go to VDT's website and look at... Um, clips of my past work or reflections of me talking about the work. It's like there's a, a book archive of the books that sort of triggered um, my work over the years. So it's physical, real-world objects that then trigger a digital response. And it's quite a new way of doing it. A lot of kids have come in and kind of go, oh, we're usually asked to put our mobile phones away when we come to a workshop. And of course, the whole concept is to kind of go, right, let's use what we use every day as part of what we're doing. Which is quite unusual for a dance. I mean, I don't really think of myself as dance, but dance theatre um, thing. I think we're trying to integrate those two mm. methodologies and those two ways of being in a space. And the results are fantastic. They're really wide ranging. Mm. And no one's bulking at that integration of cognitive, physical, getting messy tasks with then capturing and um, distributing digitally. So I think, um, for me, it's a really successful little project because it's sort of really doing that with exactly the way that I'm saying the same digital technology can do that with a, a, a female, particularly body. And as a, as a teacher, and, and you know, it's this, exciting. this might work for you and your social work students or whatever, I, you know, I kind of think, well, this would be very beneficial for my sociology students exploring particular ideas to sit mm -hmm. around and engage with these different types of materials. It's not, and again, it, it, this is a different kind of knowledge space that is producing different kind of languages, that yeah. knowledge that is in different languages, um, but is nonetheless kind of valuable and interesting and provocative and, and all the rest of it. So I think, you and know... the languages that are produced range in terms of audio, mm. like I said, mm. visual, text-based stuff, something for email me, me about things, you know, short soundbite text-based Twitter type things. And it is, it, it's sort of acknowledging that you can have a response in any of those languages mm. and they're all as valid as each other. Mm. And there's a couple of movement tasks 
I mean, in a way, we kept the movement task to a minimum just because we've done that to death over 20 years and we wanted to try something different. But, but those drama students, they want to move. Those drama students, they want to <laughs> run around in the salt or whatever it is, the talcum powder over there, but, and why not? Um, but it's almost trying to thwart their expectations of what a dance theatre workshop might be as well, I suppose. This is the devil in me is trying to do that too. Do you know how you'll use the material that's being generated? Yeah, I mean, we're... we're, we're with, with, with this 21 Years, 21 Works project, we've sort of um, tried to give as, in, as much importance to the digital online work as we have to the um, stage live work, which is dangerous, of course, because I've spent most of my time making live stuff. Um, but what we're trying to do is grow a repository of um, user-generated content online, and there will be galleries of the materials from Warwick, from London, from um, Leeds, from Birmingham, um, from Brighton. Uh, so there'll be galleries of where people can return back to what they made and see it online, uh, set in a sort of gallery amongst other people's work. So we're not just going, oh, thanks very much, good night. It's like it's going to re resurge back on our website. And then people will hopefully come back to the website. So there's a sort of circular use of our website. So it's sort of not just us using the website as a marketing tool, but we're using it as um, a resource. Um, and the digital work that Sean and I have done around my archive, my 21 years work, are some short videos of me um, trying to remember and explain the co concepts of, of all the 21 pieces that, well, maybe more than that, but we've chosen 21 pieces. So I'm trying to use text, my own words, to describe why I made them, how I made them, who made them with me. So there's a sort of library of, um, of just mapping the work that I've made, because to be honest, you get 21 years in and you realise you've got quite a large body of work and you've never really bothered <laughs> to capture it in any other way than shitty videos at the back of the theatre. So what we've been trying to do is kind of go, right, let's take the archiving seriously of everything that we've made as a company, which is a lot of collaboration and a lot of artists and a lot of production um, management over a long time. And so we're trying to, some of the tasks take you to the website, some of them make you <laughs> sort of create new content. Um, and I think that'll just keep growing, won't it, Sean? We're hoping that'll keep growing. Um, we're doing Brighton Festival in May, it's going to stay alive till then, and then Sean will process them, we'll probably end up with a little documentary about this experience and the kind of walkthrough spaces in Shoreditch and in Brighton. So it's sort of trying to shift the language that we're using as a company, not away from the stage, but a parallel journey digitally mm -hmm. and video-wise. Well, we've got a lot of that process, by, you know, because if you and Sean are in you might spend six weeks with all sorts of mm. stuff like this, and so lots of people are getting inside the process of yeah. making those ways and, and their own their own process. I've been intrigued how much they got to your process. Mm. Not just looking when you're talking about it, but by doing it. Yeah, and, and that's why we wanted to sort of everything is all authentic, isn't it? Yeah. And then they see it online and go, oh, you know, it's another connection. Yeah. It's it's, it's actually really it's tangible. So it's I mean for me it, when we were designing this, it wouldn't have worked to just have the laptops and the tasks. There needs mm. to be something physical, and there need to be real things. And they are slightly depleted because we've had a lot of people in, but you know we, we can build them up again. But it's you know these are all things that we've used in in the work over the years, and it's quite simple. You know, I think I think simple is good. That's why people are engaging. They're not overwhelmed by it. It's just like the tasks are reasonably simple tasks, but the content that they're generating is actually very thoughtful. Um, the problem I have with it is, and I might be the only one, yeah. I have a crappy Nokia phone, which like, yeah, 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 which, yeah. which cost me fifteen pounds <laughs> and won't yeah. connect to the internet. <laughs> uh, and I can't. But we, we have yeah. a VDT mobile you could use yeah. to capture things, yeah. and, and also, so longer, lots yeah, of people also partners and did in groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. every task can kind of be an individual or a group, or you know, it's, it's very, you know, um, self-led really. Mm -hmm. So we just can't. Yeah. And, and it's also mixed the technologies because you know there's the real old school technology too, and 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 I've certainly used things like that in, in work I've done before. Where I think people kind of write stuff on a chalkboard that's very temporary, and you know you can mess about, and they write things on a chalkboard that they wouldn't write, uh, you know, in a more formal or certainly online space or where there might be some permanence. So I think there's in a way having it's kind of interesting having these different modes, and actually there's a sketchbooks. And you know all kinds of things well, where. One student who didn't have a smartphone. I just actively chose not to have them mm. an online presence. And that's quite interesting. In 1718, I don't. I don't go near the. You expect to be an old person. Mm. 
Well, and also, I mean, we did a trial. We did do a trial of this in Brighton in, in our little space, and um, the first thing that, that we ask is who's on Instagram, who's on Twitter, da, da, to see if they've got the technology to engage with some of the tasks. And actually, several people went, "No, I, I hate it." So, you know, we're accommodating that as well. You can go through the space and not do this at all. I mean, that's how it's designed. You can mm. you can be here physically and um, organically, or you can be here digitally. <laughs> Any other thoughts on uh, any of the um, other things we've touched upon, people that haven't spoken yet? Any other thoughts whizzing around your head? Yeah, Cliff. This idea of archive, I find absolutely fascinating. Mm. The, the idea of the specificity of response in, in language and the specificity of emotional response that's capable through non-linguistic things. Yeah. And I think it's really fascinating when it comes up against that idea of canon that you raised earlier. Mm. The simple fact that technologically, mm. for the vast majority of our history, language is, has been far, far easier to capture mm. and far, far less effort. Mm. And this, this commitment now to capturing a, a, a less tangible emotional response to a work, now we have the available tools to do it, I think is something that as, as an artist it's really, and as, a, as, an, as an academic, it's really fantastic to mm. see a commitment to because it makes me think about it in a different way. Because mm. of course, we have the ability to capture this with a degree of specificity now, mm. which is you know not just the picture quality or the sound quality, I'm talking the, the way that you can integrate the different angles of that mm. emotional response mm. into something that is not linguistic. Mm. Yet, what do we do as artists? Quite often, we uh, we use image and sound, etc., to support the text. Not yeah. just in reports, but in the way that we talk about our work on our web. I don't have a website, but on the websites, mm. Mm. Was, we we kind of pretend that it's integrated, but we still allow language that primacy. Mm. And maybe it's not about integration. Actually, maybe it's about offering the option of saying. This is the this is my non-linguistic my yeah, report yeah, yeah. on what I have done. Yeah. This is my linguistic report of what I have done. I'm not going to necessarily. I'm going to say that perhaps the same things with both or overlapping things, mm. but I'm not going to use one to support the other. It's so interesting that yeah. because um, That's really fascinating. yeah, there's a guy called Sam Groven who wrote a PhD, finished it last year, and it was about um, Pina Bausch and deviate and my work and the majority of it was about my work and it was the first PhD that was submitted um, that was allowed to have a DVD of our rehearsal process because he sat through the whole 10, 16 weeks God help him of, of making a show called If We Go On which was a controversial show when we made it um, and it was the first I think PhD in the country that had been submitted where e uh, not equal weight but some weight was given to the uh, DVD material that he didn't have to then translate into writing so the PhD is massive, but there's this DVD that's attached to the front. I'm not sure what the details are, but it, that was him kind of going, no, I can't. I can't actually translate what I've seen in the studio into words. But also it's not necessarily useful to. Mm. No, exactly, because it, it's trying to give primacy to a different language. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a bit of a refusal or a bit of a demand on his behalf that the academic institutions would take. You know, it's not an add-on, it's not an appendices, it's, it's the work. thing. <laughs> and of course there are things that both those approaches are better at and it's not about yeah. an exclusionary or a flip from one to the other. Yeah. Obviously, mm. But it's, it's really making me think about my, what I assume to be the interplay and the mutual support between the two and how perhaps it isn't truly, mm. truly mm. that at the moment and we should, we should maybe think about it. Yeah. You know, I think the other thing that comes out of what you've just said to me is this, I mean, I think that's all the time, but just this act of translation. And bizarrely, when you were talking then, I thought of John Donne, the metaphysical poet, and how he translated his emotional response into language all those years ago, and, and it, it remains with us. I was thinking about that for some reason. Mm. And also, um, on Radio 4 the other day, John Humphreys, or whoever it is these days, wasn't John Humphreys because he's gone, but anyway, the other guy... Um, was talking about we're, we're actually misled to think that all this digital capturing is actually going to last because the technology is moving so fast that the formats that it's in now in 100 years time yeah, better John better. Dunn ain't going to be, you know, he'll still be here because it was written mm. <laughs> but actually you won't be able to capture these files in 100 years because the te technology will be so different so that everyone's panicking actually in the archiving world of like 
you know, it's like I had a, 20 years ago, I had one of those Apple Macs with the, with the disc things, and I've still got a couple of them. It's like, well, what do you do with that? And actually, when we were thinking about this archive, Sean and I were thinking, can we have a slide projector? Because we came across a load of transparencies. Nobody uses those anymore. So it's sort of like, it's like, how do you keep up with the technology? So it's actually a fallacy that we're, all this archiving that we're doing is actually going to be readable in 100 years anyway, yeah. in some respects. So I find that fascinating, that we think we're being so diligent but then it, it, the, same, not. the same could be said of emo the capture of emotional response anyway because Absolutely, of the change yeah. in context, the social context in which it occurs. It's not necessarily... The language might still be more useful in 100 mm. years than mm. now. The emotional mm. response is mm. because, because of the changes in the, the context in which that occurs in specific events. Or it might not, yeah. but it's a, that, yeah, that's really... I hadn't thought about that. But also, so, so John Donne or, or, um, yeah, or, or Shakespeare are still here because they're written in a form that we still use. And I'm just wondering what's going to happen to all these new forms. Are they going to somehow mutate and still be readable? Um, well, they'll mean something different because there's also yeah. what, what does the archive do? <clears throat> you know, do you want the archive to be something that in 20 years, 100 years, people go, that's what what's happening and that is the truth about this thing or do you want them to be able to engage with it and make a new reality out of it mm -hmm. you know because of course mm -hmm. it, it will be necessarily I think you can't control for how just like you can't control for mm -hmm. how audiences you know experience your work you can't control for how future people engaging with an archive will read the material whether mm -hmm. it's digital mm -hmm. or material or textual or whatever um, but it's letting go of some of those certainties isn't it it's the same kind of thing about you know, being prepared to live with this kind of fluidity and uncertainty around um, knowledge and bit practice and whatever, putting it out there and, and not necessarily controlling for what it means. And what's so interesting about that is that uncertainty and failure and accidents mm. are the things that make good work mm. and they're the things that are immeasurable <laughs> and they don't fit in neatly to any fucking mm. key performance indicators, do they? So it's sort of how, how you... <coughs> I mean, I'm really serious about that. The accidents are always the most interesting things, aren't they? The, the stumbling across, oh, God, that moment, just that moment in an improvisation, just that bit there, if we can just pull that out and build on it, just that bit, the rest of shit. You know, it's those moments that are very difficult to articulate and very difficult to capture, and they're not um, necessarily cognitive. They're felt, they're, um, they can be visual, felt, whatever, sonic. I, I'm really interested in this sort of, sort of circling around this idea of capturing yeah. and saying... Well, how do you capture an emotion? Why, why, why are we becoming obsessed with capturing documentation? Mm. I, th I keep on having, I think it's a uh, Mary Klein quote, uh, which is something like, we only become powerless when we forget we have power, and thinking about our related relationships with funders and mm. not wanting to express key performance indicators or whatever. Mm. But we can only change those situations with that, that relationship if we actually say, no, I'm going to send you a DVD of the rehearsal process. That's that's. That's sort of why I mentioned the PhD, because I was really bowled over by his boldness, because he risked not getting the PhD by saying, sorry, but that's the form. Yeah, but there's no reason why we can't no. do that, actually. And, and in terms think of... Think about how, how artists in Scotland uh, took a different control of the relationship with Craig in Scotland and just said, no, enough, get rid yeah. of Andrew. Uh, he's not doing the job, and actually, we want a structure which is more like this. Mm. I think in this country, we seem to be just going, okay, fill in the spreadsheet, <laughs> yeah. and do the key. But well, today could be the start of a revolution. Let's then. Get on with that. And I think you know, there's so much here <laughs> about how how we're circling what we think might be a different model mm. of work. Yeah, but circling is, rather than yeah, embracing. Right. Or but this is why I think the relationships between academics and artists are really interesting because I think we're we're all circulating. Uh, or circling rather mm. something, and if we come together to sort of find these languages, we might find a different way of expressing mm. it. We might say, actually, no, we've been doing it fine all along. Mm. We just need to say it slightly differently, mm. but say it in our language, not in anybody else's language, mm. because it's that authenticity and that passion that audiences respond to. Isn't it? Mm. You know, we want to communicate the value and impact of what we do differently, essentially, to our audiences. Mm. Because if our audiences believe and understand that they're the electorate. Like they're the people who can sort of take power back themselves, yeah. and and then we can you know have that social sense of social change that I think we're all working mm. towards. Mm. 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 Mm.
Well, just much earlier you said something about I couldn't, I couldn't capture it or I couldn't evidence it apart from a conversation with my relationship officer. And I think that's one of the sort of unspoken things about underlying work language. So you'd expect me to say this, but that we sort of think there are some kinds of discourse that are just not valuable. And actually, that we use it all the time. Are. We already mm -hmm. do it. So, mm -hmm. of course, it doesn't capture the visual and the embodied. But it does capture the emo it can capture the emotional and the difficult to say and the intangible and the and peripheral and all of those things. And we actually we all know this. We're all desperate to get in a room. I mean, if it's about the arts council or if it's about the media or speaking with the audience, what we want is to be face to face with human beings yeah. in a dialogue with yeah. them. And that Absolutely. dialogue is then embodied in all sorts of ways. So I, I, I think some of it is about valuing what we already yeah. do. Mm. And if one of our key performance indicators is that we'll have lots of really fantastic conversations about it, mm. there's, there's a, we need a kind of courage to mm. say that. And I, I, I feel I ought to put in a little word for Shakespeare, just that <laughs> I think there is a really interesting danger that in, inherent in, it, in the way we're talking, which I obviously encounter quite often, that somehow language is, is, is male, is objective, isn't metaphorical, is literal, is... Um, violent and of course it can be all those things but the, the, if you think that about Shakespeare you don't want to come most people don't want to come <laughs> in fact the reason I think he's lost is not because you can write him down but precisely because he's metaphorical and yeah, mm. tangible mm. and mm. complex yeah. and dramatic yeah. and all of those all of those things so I think there is a very I think there's a powerful link to be made with the I mean you make it with John Donne with those artists who have been successfully captured over mm. hundreds of years. Mm. Actually, what they're doing is something much more slippery than we mm. like to think. Mm. And that our sort of marketing speak, the transactional way that we talk to one another, say says yeah. Shakespeare's great because he's really old and he's been around for ages and you should know yeah, that. Shakespeare's funny and dramatic. But it's, it's, and it's, it's yeah. about something much more, yeah. much stranger. Yeah. that we, we find difficult to express to people, mm. but it's exactly the intentions, it seems to mm. me, what you're talking about in your work. And also, I think most people these days collaborate and most people work interdisciplinarily. <laughs> um, and, you know, we use text to generate loads of our material, it just might not end up in the show. And we know how slippery and um, useful and metaphorical text can be. Yeah. <laughs> and so I certainly wasn't just a cab. I certainly no, no, wasn't. No, 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 I wasn't like you were saying, text yeah. is specific and movement is you know, ethereal. Mm. That's bullshit. And there's text in text as well. And you know, certainly in, in, academ in academic mm. worlds um, and in the social sciences, I think it is true to say that a lot of language is masculinist and yeah. you know it, it kind of comes out of those traditions and it gets its authority from precisely those ways of writing and the, the formats that we're required to write and publish in do I think you know reproduce those yes. problematic norms but that doesn't mean that there isn't a space for a very different kind of writing that actually is much mm. more affective mm. maybe poetic you know much less literal and of course you know that's been part of a, a kind of feminist politics mm. of, of, of rewriting and writing in different ways including in quite mainstream academic forms um, so much like you know, the Art Council documents, the, the publications, the PhDs, all of these are different sites of power where these kinds of experiments or stopping circling around something but actually getting in there and mm. doing it mm. can be kind of simultaneously done. And I think that is quite important that we do it in mm. our different kind of realms. And actually, I mean, people often... <coughs> uh, this is slightly an aside, but it isn't. It's absolutely connected to what you both just said, that... Um, the first stage of my creative process is having to articulate on paper through text what I'm going to do to get the money to do it, mm. whether it's a three-year thing or a one-project thing. And one bit of feedback that I've consistently had from the Arts Council is that I'm very articulate and they can really imagine what I'm going to do from the things that I write. And that's because I'm from a literature background and I am good with words, you know, I can mm. articulate. I know a lot of choreographers who really struggle with putting on the page what they want to do so already they're having to translate what's an imagistic or a, a visceral mm -hmm. or a physical thing into language, you know, text language, in order to get the support, and it just doesn't translate. Yeah, one of the kids from the choreography um, course the other day was saying, looking at the, the, that work that's got the images of dancers, oh, yeah. and, um, and saying that, you know, she always works up there, she because there are no words, you can't put it in words. You know, it was a real strong sense that this is the only way I can kind of communicate my ideas mm. because the words don't do it. So mm. that's absolutely mm. true. Yeah. Do you think there's something beyond 
Well, you absolutely recognise that. It's really familiar to me, the desire to have other forms with which we communicate with our funders. Do you think there's something more sinister at play that, that what, what we're doing, those of us who are funded in that way or, or relating to institutions in that way, we're treating that interaction, so tell, write in 150 words what you're going to do, to be the value we place on the work, when actually it's, o it's only an interaction about money. And not, not, to, not to undervalue the fact that we can't progress it, can't mm. do it mm. without money. But it is only that. It's not how society values Play it or it how we value it. It's simply um, well, I think, a I means think, to an end. I think the chase becomes to get the golden tick from the Arts Council. I'm very wary of it. I'm very grateful um, that's for all the it is. support that I get. Yeah. But I'm really clear mm. that it's, it's the government supporting what I do. Thank you. But I know I'm really clear that when I articulate it, however poetically, in an application, that that's all it is. That's the first step in a, in a rung. Uh, it's really making me think about the role of the producer in all this, because mm. in a way, that, uh, the, the producer is the person that's trying to articulate to different parties without whom you can't make something happen, something which is ethereal and intangible. And actually, it... The, uh, this conversation is all about bringing that conversation to the artist and to a language that they want to articulate that they feel expresses the work in the right way. But actually, uh, the artist the producer is sort of the opposite as well, because you're, you're trying to persuade people whose motivations are not the motivations of the artist or the producer uh, to get behind an idea that, that you're not able to make happen by yourself. So actually, there's, there's a... Uh, there is a, a, a kind of real frustration with the pointlessness of some application processes and the way that you talk about working them. But actually, uh, that uh, is separate to the work and is a is a, 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 a sort of craft function of making it happen in the same way that learning how the lighting desk works is, if that's your speciality. Um, I think I think that's definitely true. There's, you know, I always talks about the linguistic skills of producers talking to venues, talking different languages to venues, audiences, artists, uh, stakeholders. Um, but I, I don't know whether that function is actually perpetuating the dysfunctionality of that relationship, actually, because I it, actually it, think there it is, is always, always but something but you can translate. But, but I think the, we the, don't the, but the work itself is what the real conversation is. So that that's that's the thing that you're supporting. So the, the, the important conversation is what, so archiving is a separate mm. bit of it, and a, and a conversation over time about something which happens at, in a specific moment in time. So that's sort of, that's, uh, that's a separate articulation. But actually the important conversation that we're all preserving is the one that happens in the moment which is live, and that's, that's why it's there. Um, but then, then um, yeah, I don't know why I'm arguing. I, I, yeah. I, I, I think, but uh, I do. I'm thinking now here. Uh, I've been thinking now about that mediation and that that moderation of language, yeah. language. And if we're, you know, we're being enforced KPIs and extrinsic factors yeah. as a defining the value of the work, which are separate from that. Well, no, no, because actually, from a producing point of view, things like that can be really <coughs> useful because you can keep everybody away from what's important. Because a KPI is something that we want them as possible, we, don't we? Do we? All the time? Yeah, we you do, see, I'm, we I, do I have to say, moment. Ed, I'm we actually do. really suspicious of producers because really? I've self produced for 25 years. Yeah. And I get really irritated, not with you two because you're great, but with some producers who um, articulate wrong things on behalf yeah. of me. It's like, what are you talking about? That's not what I mean. Yeah. So I've become very versed in talking about my own work myself. It's not a control thing, she says. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually that I know, I do know best. It's my work, and yeah. I'm articulate. So why can't, I mean, I know some artists can't talk as well about their work, but I actually think sometimes that mediation is really dangerous because it keeps us like children, actually. Mm. It keeps us mm. infantilised mm. in the same way that ballet mistresses keep the dancers mm. silent and infantilised. That... Oh, I can't talk about my own work. Can you talk? I, I know that's not what you do, and that's not the modern way. But it can dangerously be yeah. that that like well, I do, that I don't think that's the I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's, it's more that you're you're persuading people for whom there isn't that interest mm. to to get involved in something. Yeah. 
But I would say that the currency of, of, if you think that what you're doing has any meaning or importance, that you should, as an artist, be able to articulate that. I really feel very strongly yeah. about it, whether it's in partnership with a producer or not. Yeah. Because if you can't do that, why should you be supported? I feel yeah. quite strongly about that. Yeah. If I can't articulate what the hell I'm doing and convince someone to support me, then there's a bit of me. I mean, okay, producers can certainly give access to people that I can't reach as one person, and that's great. But I think it should be a partnership. I don't really, and this is possibly a feminist thing, I don't want to be spoken for, actually. Yeah. I'm really clear about I, that. I, I, I totally agree with all that. Do you know well. what I mean? That's yeah, not I to totally, totally agree with all that, um, without, you know, without any, uh, any hesitation at all. Mm. Um, but I think that, that the responsibility of the artist and the producer is to maintain the integrity of the moment of performance. So that's exactly on the same... But what artist yeah. do you know that wouldn't want to protect the integrity of the moment of the performance? Because that's why we do it. So do we need... As yeah, a yeah, serious yeah, question, absolutely. do we need to but be that, handheld that's the in that way? Yeah. 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 I, I, I support it. Just shame. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there are those moments when it's, it is far better for an artist just to get on the main show. And yeah, of course. Have the conversation yeah, yeah. With who then translates the thing because then artists can focus on making work. I'm thinking about people like Mole from mm. Reckless Sleepers who is awful at expressing the work and he mm. really needs it to mm. translate it because mm. he just wants to be in the room making it. Yeah, who doesn't? Actually, yeah. Uh, an intangible thing to him at the point at which he needs to communicate. Yeah. So but the sinister thing and something that I probably noticed happens when I speak on behalf of my own work is that sometimes speaking on behalf of your own work changes the work. Mm. And that, that's, that's the danger. That's, 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 the, that's the that's the that's the thing I you've got to that. keep separate. Yeah. And I would like to be able to talk about my own work and make a case for my own work, absolutely. But if I'm doing that before I make the work, how yeah. much does that process of, of making it an argument in on those terms? Which terms mm. are you talking about, Ray? Well, Where if I'm making if I'm making it on arts council form, if I'm making it to a, a venue that has a particular agenda that I want to appeal to, that changes. But that's where you have to hold steady in terms of what it is that you want to do and not be swayed and think of it as a means to an end because I think you can be battered into squeezing your work. I think it's more insidious than that. Do you? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. But partly because Maybe you don't necessarily know. I mean, you, it sounds to me that, that you're, what you're able to articulate, which is wonderful, is a very particular process which allows you then to not know the outcomes but to follow the process and to have, have a a sense of aspiration about the outcome. Mm. Well, it's very hard, I mean, you know, I switch hats, so mm. I look after writers very, very hard often for a playwright, I, I, in my experience, to be able to say what, what the outcome really will be. We know what the territory is, we know what uh, the sort of spaces we want to be in. Yeah. We might know some very practical things about cast life. But if we start saying it will definitely appeal to this kind of audience, no, I never say that. Point, mm. Exactly. So that's where I think it is insidious. What you just described is exactly the choreographic process, by the way. Well, you don't know the exact outcome. Well, exactly. Yeah. So you So I think there's something very. I, I really agree that there is something very dangerous in our culture that says you ought to be able to know in advance. We do so I, I see what you mean. Okay. In the way we finance things. Mm. Mm. That we're trying to, and so, so, so mm. while I do absolutely have sympathy, and I play this role a lot, is, ha is, is articulating a version yeah. well, that's of what all we might do. happen yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with yeah. such conviction that hmm. everyone believes that is in fact what will happen. No, that's exactly what you want. With exactly enough space for the yeah. artist to do in fact what they want. To do. But how else? And I how don't else mean I'm speaking it? for them. I think, no. I think you know, but that's exactly what. Different. Yeah. But I'm speaking about them mm -hmm. in a way that might allow funding yeah. to be secured for yeah. them to have free, free yeah. space to yeah. So here's a different thought on that. I agree with everything you just said. That's exactly Excellent. what I do. Yeah. I was going to say that there's almost a shredding, shredding to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can never say it. Uh, you know, that guy who talks mm -hmm. about quantum. Yeah. But there's a light shredding in that one. Uh, there's a sort of quantum state to a project where if you open the box, you actually fix that. And if you can yeah. describe the box very without it, yeah. then actually you don't get yourself. I think the key is what Erica said. You, you you can articulate a version of what might happen with the full knowledge that you've said you make an eight-person piece and might end up with one man and a dog. Sorry, Arts Council, that's how it ended up. But I think we need to be bold enough to end up with a product and say this is where the process led me and that's where we fall down because we said we'd do a piece with eight people and live music and a big set and. Did a, you know, we have to be courageous enough to say, 
to articulate a version and know that the end result might be very different. But those conversations, I, I partly feel, I'm a maker and a producer sometimes, mm. so, so in a way those conversations are just another part of the art. Because, okay. you know, it sounds like around this table we think that if an audience <coughs> member can have uh, a multiplicity of interactions and responses on offer to them, that's good, and that they should have the space within which they can respond in the dialogue with a piece of work and it can mean to them what they want it to mean to them. So why can't that be true of a funder? If a particular funding body or individual has a particular agenda and you find a way to articulate the work so that when they fund it and then experience it, it feels like it's, it's the thing they want it to be, then in a way that's sort of part of so I, I think the whole process of making it is yeah. part of the art, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's sort of what I meant when I said when I first articulate it on paper, that's the beginnings, the stirrings of what images I've got in my head and how to articulate them. It's not the end product, but it's a version of what might happen. Anna, did you want to say something? Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it's a little bit related to this the sinister feeling of, uh, of language and how we're trying to put everything into a certain way and how it insidiously kind of affects everything. There's an example, with, um, particularly with uh, making dance, that there was a policy in Tony Blair's era that um, there was a way of uh, documenting what, you, what, what happened, the outcome of your dance performance. And it really started to nail in this idea of um, community and how it's how many people how it's linked to how many people it affected how many people saw the show but actually how it really affected communities and how many community participants there were whether they were engaged as audience or as mm. members and actually what happened over ten years was that dance work actually became every the big popular movement was to make community dance work to make participatory things so it actually changed. The form. The, the form of, yeah. of the things of people. And it was small, it was really small. It happened bit by mm. bit. It wasn't and of course there were people who went, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a community work now, because that's gonna get funded. Brilliant. Of course there was an immediate response, but actually what happened is that it changed it really, really small. What happened so that actually now we think I must engage this, this, this I must do this, oh, I'm gonna to make to. so it's, it's much more insidious than it, in that way, which is a really yeah. That's and sort that of what has led from a policy kind of, you know, instruction. And, and there, are, there will always be trends, and that's sort of what I meant about the immersive thing. Yeah, hurrah for immersive theatre, but I think it's part of a larger socio-political drive towards wanting the proximity to reduce between you and the, um, the material. And for me, it's connected with how we use social media. And so, uh, you know, I think we have to no take notice of what trends are making us make different work and whether we're getting pulled in a direction that maybe we don't want to get pulled in or whether we're just happy to be pulled in that direction. But are we being true to the idea that we have <laughs> as artists? Are we following that through or not? Because that's, that's all we've got is ideas. That's our currency. It's and interesting though that that really echoes Tay, which is the biggest yeah. country of the liberal, I guess. Yeah, the Big Brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tony used to make proper films, proper documentaries. Mm -hmm. Now everyone makes them about themselves. Yeah. They're all constructed reality. And you think about that as a pervasive source of consumption. Yeah, yeah. and that's and the, the cultural and outcome. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's really stuck in mm -hmm. some ways, exactly what's happening in television mm -hmm. in the last decade. And it's kind of making it work. Mm -hmm. yeah, you also get influence from lots of different areas. There's a uh, particular study. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of where you have to put it kind of through the digital platform being available. It sort of affected every art form and lots and lots of different. But I do think, we, as imaginative people, what we have to do is say, OK, um, I mean, we're talking about funding a lot, but OK, um, people who support my work, if you want reach, I'll find my way of reaching people. And if you want engagement, I'll find a way to engage that is connected to my aesthetic and my interests and my feminist politics and my this and Because otherwise, you're just a monkey. You're just doing what you think you should be doing, like Anna says, instead of doing what is actually in your heart and what, what you want to get out there and put out there. And what's the point of being a creative person if you're just following the trend? And what that means is you have to take risks and go in the other, you know, go running in the hills the other way sometimes. And that is very awkward 
because you're pulling against the mainstream. And um, I know that my work will never be mainstream, and I, I'm not so sad about that because I think it's um, it's authentic to me. So I think and, and to people that I collaborate with. So there's something about that that's di a difficult truth to swallow. Like I know I could probably be more successful if I if I did this, this, or this, but I'm not maybe so interested in doing this, this, and this. Can I suggest? Because I don't want to stop what <laughs> is like a really interesting, evolving discussion, but that we try and kind of carry it on over some engagement with the task, because we promised people a bit of time in the space um, to you know, look at the, at the tasks and do them if you'd like to do them and, um, and talk about some of the material that's been produced. So there's clearly some kind of dialogues that have already started and people will want to continue and that was kind of the point of, of this um, this activity so hopefully that will and you know feel free to carry on those in the space that would be really nice um, and there's no limit on time I have to go and teach at 12 but there's for other people um, you're welcome to stay here as long as you like um, and, and carry on talking and doing and playing and making and watching film and doing all of the other stuff um, does that sound okay yeah yeah Okay. Yeah, unless there's any other, I mean, anyone that hasn't yeah. spoken, does anyone else want to say anything about the conversation that we have been having? Any burning yeah. unspoken thoughts? I, mean, I'm, I suppose I'm just interested because it very quickly mm. becomes about producing and funding and for those of us who are in that sort of way, but those of you who aren't, are there any other immediate thoughts before we close down the conversation? I think for me something really came out about the relationship between when we talk about audiences and students when we teach with mm. them that you see a lot of parallels mm. and I can't really say anything articulate because it's all whizzing around in my mm. head so I can't really say what I'm thinking but um, that's sort of important is mm. that you know we we get students to do things like think about employability and entrepreneurialism and that's almost the only way we get them to think about themselves as being people outside of mm. being students mm. but if we could give them all these affective and emotional experiences they do so many more things with themselves as whole people that we don't have a mm. chance to record or measure or give value yeah. to. Yeah. And it just strikes me that that's something that makes me challenge how I teach mm. and how I think of my students. And that's what I'm really taking away from today, mm. is that I need to think more carefully about what I ask students to do when I teach them and how I measure what they then achieve. So thank one you. Of, one, of, one of the things that came out of me being on the This Is Tomorrow programme was, um, I think I said this in one of my proposals, of, of, or if I didn't, I meant to, is how do we find a, um, a, a methodology to measure the imagination? Because what you're actually talking about is, is uh, imagination as a currency is really difficult to, to measure in any way. But that is the key to creativity. It's the key to finding new ways forward, whether it's digital or analogue or whatever. And that's what you're actually talking about here. Well, we get them to, to do all these amazing things, and they come out of the classroom with glowing faces, and they're like, oh, no, I've got to write an essay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that sad? Yeah, that's the same thing that we've articulated about the funding well, application. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Any, anyone else, just before we finish? Ladies over there, another thoughts? No? I just think about ethics, really. Mm. Sorry, people. <laughs> I think because I, I came from work and I came from different disciplines, I suppose. So that and interdisciplinary in working into a relation, it was really important to me. And I found that I was kind of squashed into a box when I tried to do something with dance because uh -huh. it, it was part of my lived experience and trying to transfer that into sort of an academic type, you know, currency. Mm. It, it was quite quite difficult and I felt kind of a little bit pressured in it's quite enlightening to hear that there are other ways of doing things and expressing things and actually everything is quite interrelated. Mm -hmm. so, that's all mm. I'm saying. Great, thank you. That's I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could dance your PhD? <laughs> and people do, they yeah. do actually. Yeah. Yeah. They have to write as well. Oh, but no, but that's what I mean, why yeah, yeah. dance the whole thing? Well, maybe Warwick can... It take a long time. Because I'm wanting to do a PhD <laughs> yeah, at some point. So Matt, yeah. there's your chance, matey. Warwick University can um, allow me to do a dance PhD. I'll be there. It's always fun to do it at the master's level. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's the master's level. Imagine me doing master's PhD. Have you met exactly Colin yet? Like <laughs> yeah. No words. No words. No words. 
No, absolutely. No numbers. No numbers. <laughs> Good. And on that note, <laughs> shall we? Okay. Say, just, something you mentioned last night was about the fact that you wanted to be able to bring the whole of you to. You I was just thinking why, why, why the whole of you shouldn't be part of your professional identity. I, I, this is particularly time for me because I'm interested in what what that means in terms of you know, mainstream schooling as well, yeah. when you kind of you know, position things and, and what would need to be different to make that happen. And I mm. suppose for me, it's just listening to what what people are, people are saying. Is it, it's a kind of sense of uh, in what ways would we need to adjust the kind of environment um, in order that, in order that more of yourself could seem relevant rather than the bit that seems to be identified or required. In the same way as, you know, when you do your arts council application that says, you know, what's your objective going to be, you've got to turn something cerebral. You've got, you know, you've got to get that idea clear, you've got to argue it in a particular way, which means that actually the impetuses, the whole impetuses for it, have to be, you know, to slice them away. But how, the key, the key yeah. impetus for an arts council application has to be the imaginative bit. And I have stuck to my guns over the years about that. That's the, that's the bit I'm concerned but about. Do you, do, you see, do you not feel a tension in translating that into words that it takes away from that source? Um, no, because yeah, as you, Eric is... You're, you, you're clearly very comfortable in, in words mm. as well as yeah. in dance. Yeah, and, and as I said... That's necessarily always true. Though, no, that's what I said earlier, that, that a lot of dance artists mm. find yeah. that really tricky. They don't have the articulation. But, sorry, just to go back to your point, just to finish off that... Um, one thing I was talking about last night from a feminist perspective were, was this notion that, particularly as women, that we hide quite big parts of ourselves in order to exist as professionals because we're sort of buying into quite a patriarchal um, structure of being professional and carrying ourselves in a certain way. So, you know, you don't know if people have got children, you don't know what their um, sort of home life is, you don't give value to the effort that they put into domesticity, say. And, and that's fine in one respect, because we're operating in a, in a professional context, but um, I was saying last night, wasn't I, that Jude Kelly, who runs the South Bank Centre... Um, you know, she's appealing for women to be able, particularly women or parents, to be able to operate in a more holistic way and instead of hiding that bit of our life for it somehow to be acknowledged and given value to so that we can operate in a, a, as whole women, not as just the bit of me that I'm going to show you because you'll take me seriously if I just show you the quite the hard-nosed, articulate female leader bit. Because actually there's a much more interesting bit than that bit. But I keep that hidden because no one takes me seriously if I bring that to a boardroom. So it's not, again, that I'm talking about vomiting that bit into the professional landscape. I'm talking about that bit being given some currency and some value in the mix so that we can be whole, not a bit. Because surely, as Jude would argue, if, if you bring your whole self to something, you will um, fly. And, and that also is uh, for me about the imagination so I'm not going to hide the imagination and focus on KPIs, I'm going to keep going, here's the imaginative bit here it is, oh here it is again and that's the bit we need to focus on as artists for sure mm -hmm.